because the Christian is the only one who claims a supernatural birth. You know, all the other ethical theories, you're lifting yourself up by your own ethical bootstraps to be a better person. But the Christian is somehow claiming that this thing is supernaturally done within you. It is not just an effort. Christianity speaks of transformation in a person's life. But despite all the efforts, it can sometimes feel like an impossible change. How do we take what we learn in the gospel and make those changes in our lives? Find out today on Just Thinking as author and apologist Ravi Zacharias takes questions from a live audience. Welcome to another Friday Q&A with Ravi Zacharias, where today we begin a series that comes from a session recorded in Canada at the University of Waterloo. The first question is a very honest one, and it's something we have probably all felt at one time or another. Despite our best efforts, sometimes it can feel impossible to change our sinful ways. If you felt that way, you'll want to hear Ravi's answer. Here's the full question in part one of the University of Waterloo q and I was just wondering... Um... For just one individual to to um, be transformed uh, into Christ likeness is um, it's it's such a big process of not just the mind but the body, the emotions, the will, um, and from from my standpoint, from my personal experience, it's such a from the efforts that I put in, it seems like such a impossible thing. How how do you think um, do we reconnect the gospel to to our living our our lived experience? Appreciate that question. It's a very candid question, and I think it has a thorny side to it, and it has, I think, a comfortable side to it too. Uh, it is true because uh, I mentioned this the other night when I was speaking that the Christian, I think, has a tremendous uh, imperative here because the Christian is the only one who claims a supernatural birth. You know, all the other ethical theories, you're lifting yourself up by your own ethical bootstraps to be a better person. But the Christian is somehow claiming that this thing is supernaturally done within you. It is not just an effort. Uh, and if that is the claim, then I think it's a very serious claim we need to look at. You know, uh, there are a lot of books coming out these days um, that I think have at least a high degree of truth in some of the uh, inferences we may draw from it. They're talking about how much our DNA really affects who we are. There's a chemistry to who we are. And that DNA, I think, is not just in our individuality or in our familial ties. I believe it goes back to our race and to our culture. So that if somebody is raised in a land where there's a cumulative effect of a certain type of a belief for centuries, there are, I think, serious certain dispositions that that person is bound to be raised with, even possibly born with. Because if the chemistry is affected, the body, in the way you live your life out and your belief out, is it possible that you're passing some of that on to your progeny? If this assertion turns out to be even to a small degree true, how much more remarkable are the words of Jesus that you must be born again? That my human birth cannot engineer this thing. You see, Jesus Christ does not call us to a higher ethical life. He offers us a life that we ourselves cannot produce. And what happens particularly in the West here, and now I'm, I'm part and parcel of this kind of... When I came to Canada, by the way, in 66, I was 20 years old. I was telling somebody today, there were only 500 Indians in Toronto at that time, if not in Canada. I remember if I saw another Indian across the street, I'd cross over and we'd chat and want to have a cup of tea or something. If I did that today, I'd never get anywhere because there are so many of us around here. But now, you know, uh, 38 years later, I live in this part of the world in the West and I say to myself how one's thinking changes, how one's thinking is adjusted. It therefore behooves you and me to understand that when Jesus is talking about a new birth, he is not talking about a more moral life. He's talking about a different way of looking at life. That is brought about 
by the power of God that transforms you. And when you and I come to Christ to make that commitment, we ought not to be coming to him so we could be better people, but so we could be new people alive. Jesus doesn't only make bad people good. He makes dead people live. We are dead to God. He makes us alive to him. Now, this is what I wanted to say. In this part of the world, I found out, contrary say when you go to China, you see hard work and discipline is an imperative. You cannot survive otherwise. We like the easy road out. We question our faith if we have a toothache. You know, does God really exist? Why then do I have this toothache? And uh, we just are so softened up by the way we live that we have forgotten the discipline of what it takes to live when you have the new life. And that is where the will comes in, in effort. We need to do more study, to do more understanding, to do more discipline. I'll tell you why the world is out to change the way you think. I was speaking at a military academy in the United States, and this is a problem in our culture now in the West. The chaplain said to me, they are facing king-size problems with the young men. He says, once upon a time, pornography affected a person beginning from age 12. Now it is affecting them beginning from age 5. Think of what it does to a marriage. Think of what it does to your mind. How it plunders you and can never fulfill you. It holds an idea out there that you will never be able to grasp. And yet, peddlers and that kind of stuff are plundering our university students' minds. And high school minds. And now children. With all of this attack that comes into your thinking, you've got to find the discipline to know what to watch, what to hear, what to read, where to go, how to find growth in your life. If you do not plan your life each day, somebody else will plan it for you. You know, I'm, I'm in my 58th year now, and I've come to the conclusion stronger than ever that I'm more deeply committed to Christ than I was when I turned to him at the age of 17 on a bed of suicide. Outside of him, I do not know of any other answer. But I also know it has been a difficult life to follow through on. Chesterton said it, the problem with Christianity is not that it's been tried and found wanting, but that it's been found difficult and left untried. So you have the new birth, and you follow it up with your will, and you discipline the mind to learn and study and make sense out of it. Uh, That's the way it happens individually and then in your family and in your relationships. You see, I'll close with this idea into your answer here. We often think that the choice is between God and between pleasure, my own way. And then we think it's pain that's keeping us from God. Chesterton said, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. Meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. So the pleasure alternative there is not what will bring you meaning. It is going to be when you've got sacred honor in your life to do things the right way because you're a creature of God. But it'll take a lot of discipline and a lot of connectedness and accountability here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, um, My question is... um there's a comment that I get from a lot of non-believers, non-Christians. Um, how do we explain the differences amongst the Christian church? Because sometimes they seem to be more different than even other religions, is how they've right. termed it. Maybe one First of all, thanks for the question. It is also a myth that Christianity is the only thing that's divided up into different groups. The, the Muslims often throw this at me and it's an illusion. You've got the Shias and the Sunnis and the Seveners and the Twelvers and the Ismailis and the uh, um, Sufis and the Ahmadiyyas and all of these various sects of it. So uh, everybody, wherever you'll have uh, some claimant, someone is going to come up with another claimant. The whole Sufi and the whole Sunni and Shia difference came on succession and the authority and all of that. Uh, if you go to uh, Buddhism, you've got the Mahayana version, you've got the Hinayana version, you've got the Sri Lankan version of it, you've got the Thai version of it, you've got the Tibetan version of it, the Thai Buddhist monk, by the way, who comes from this very university, got her PhD from uh, McMaster here, first woman to be ordained as a Buddhist monk in Thailand, I met her, spent three hours with her, she had to go to Sri Lanka to be ordained as a Buddhist monk because Thailand does not ordain women monks and so on, so there's these differences all over the place, so we have to understand that, now, in the Christian faith, when somebody says, you know, uh, 
uh, what, what about all of this? You know, you've got the Presbyterians and the Methodists and uh, the Baptists and this and that and uh, all these denominations or abominations or whatever you want to describe them to be. I believe, and that's why I said what I did to the gentleman here. You need to have one final authority. For the Christian, the final authority should be the Bible. That's where we stand. Paul said, let no one go beyond what is written. Jesus said that the scriptures will never be broken. Unity of faith does not necessarily mean uniformity of expression. And I believe there are some congregations where the expression would be very different to mine, and I accept them. I am much more cerebral in my thinking. Uh, I, I like to be challenged with thoughts. Thoughts encourage me more and inspire me more. I'm really not the happy clappy type uh, in my in my private life. But do I think therefore that there should not be? No, not at all. I've got wonderful friends who enjoy that kind of worship and I speak in places like that, all kinds of them. And I go, and if they accept me in my uh, eccentricities, I will accept them in their eccentricities. But the most important thing is what I practice and what I do in my theological expression should be in keeping with the scriptures and not in violation of it. Denominations sometimes come because of not so much of a contradiction, but a focus on certain doctrines that then become the envelope of the whole thing. You know, uh, Wesley and Whitfield differed greatly. Uh, theologically, but one preached at the other's funeral, you know, and uh, I think uh, it is not the tag on the outside that's going to make a difference when we stand before God is what inside the bottle. So take the scriptures and treat it as your final authority. I go to all kinds and hear all kinds of uh, volumes and uh, it doesn't have to be uniform. It's not me, but it's, it's some very fine people and I respect them for that.